Hi guys, today we're going to talk about velocity profiles and then we're going to look at a special case called the linear velocity profile. Let's get started by reminding you what a velocity profile is. I'm going to show you this short little video here and what you're going to see is there's going to be a plate in the middle of the flow or of the, of the image and there's going to be a flow above the plate that's turbulent and a flow below the plate that's laminar and they're illuminating the flow using a smoke wire so they pulse the wire you put a voltage across the wire and it uh, generates uh, hydrogen bubbles within this uh, within this liquid so take a look and uh, I hope you enjoy it The boundary layer on the bottom side is laminar and two-dimensional. On the top side, the boundary layer has been tripped by a wire placed well upstream. The unsteady motions in the turbulent boundary layer are three-dimensional. Some of the motions are perpendicular to the plane of view. These timelines correspond closely to the instantaneous velocity profiles for the two types of boundary layers. Superimposing a number of displacement lines enables us to obtain a mean velocity profile for the turbulent layer and the laminar layer, and at the same time gives an experimental notion as to where the fluctuations occur and how large they are in the plane of mean motion. In this photograph, we can compare mean laminar and turbulent profiles. Here is the laminar one, the turbulent one and here they are superimposed. The velocity gradient normal to the plate is larger for the turbulent layer and it therefore has a larger wall shear stress or drag. I remember the first time I saw this picture I was a little confused because he said that the gradient on the turbulent profile, which you can see is there, is steeper than that for the laminar profile, which is there. It's hard to see in that video. The reason is because he drew these like this, where the dependent variable is along the x-axis and the independent variable is along the, um, the uh, x-axis, sorry, and the dependent variable is along the y-axis. Typically, um, we wouldn't draw it that way. So when you draw the slopes, it's hard to interpret them. Remember the slope, du dy, is related to the, the shear stress, the viscous shear stress. Maybe the better way to have drawn this was to put the dependent variable on the x-axis, the independent variable on the y-axis, which is what we normally do. And then it's obvious to us that the slope of the turbulent profile is much, much greater than that of the laminar profile. So therefore, the shear stress of the turbulent profile would be larger uh, than the laminar profile. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're looking at these boundary layer profiles. This is the full up uh, stress tensor. And just quickly, uh, this term right here, I, this, this tensor can be written in terms of all nine components where these guys are related to the uh, shear stress and these terms are related to the compression, so uh, the, the volumetric compression terms. So the, the diagonal terms are related to this volumetric deformation and the off diagonals are related to the shear deformation. And in general, in, uh, when we first talk about fluid mechanics, we tend to focus on these deviatoric terms or the off diagonal terms. So with that in mind, let's just talk about a, a simplified boundary layer flow, the couette flow. So in a couette flow, there's usually an upper plate and a lower plate. 
and one of the two plates is usually moving. In this case, the upper plate is moving. The two plates are separated by uh, a, a height, h, and in between of the two plates, there is a fluid. The, uh, the, the x-axis here is u, little u, divided by big U. So big U is this velocity here, how fast the plate's moving, and little u is going to be the velocity inside the fluid. So for zero imposed pressure gradient, the velocity, would, we would get this linear velocity profile for Couette flow, meaning that the uh, velocity rises from the no-slip boundary condition of zero up to a value of one. That's the ratio of little u to big u should be one. Now, if we impose a pressure gradient, so I have uh, pressure on the left and pressure on the right, so that P1 minus P2 is no longer going to be zero, but some positive number. So P1 is larger than P2 in this case, so the pressure is effectively helping to push the flow along. So you can see that it extends uh, larger than the ratio of uh, of 1. So that's due to the fact that the pressure is helping to push the fluid down this channel. I could also use the pressure to, uh, to slow the fluid down. So in the case where P uh, is less than 0, meaning P2 is greater than P1, the flow is in an adverse pressure gradient situation. It doesn't want to go down the, the channel because the pressure is retarding the flow. However, it's being dragged along by the plate, and must satisfy the no-slip boundary condition. So in some region, uh, very close to the plate, the velocity is equal to 1. However, we could actually get the velocity to flow backwards if we increase the adverse pressure gradient large enough. Also, those flows that I just showed you were all steady flows. You must realize that uh, during startup, there can be transitional flows. So here the upper plate is moving and the lower plate is not. So through, through a series of images in time, you can see that the profile is developing eventually to this linear profile that we associate with no pressure gradient. Likewise, in a Poiseuille flow, which is neither plate is moving, it's only being driven by the pressure gradient, uh, upon startup, you can see that it would develop into a fully developed profile at some long time. All right, let's look more closely at the uh, flow in a pipe. So what I got drawn here is a pipe, a circular pipe, and uh, a kind of an inviscid flow is coming into the pipe. Now, because of the nature of fluid mechanics and the no-slip boundary condition, the flow at the wall must go to zero. And as a result, it slows the flow around it, right? It slows the molecules down near the wall. There's still a region that is part of the inviscid core, so I could draw that there. So you can see there's a flat profile, which is the same magnitude as the inlet flow. However, you see that the flow's got to go to zero near the wall, so we have a very sharp gradient near the wall. So we call the internal part, which is not affected by viscosity, the inviscid core. And we call the part that is affected by the, vis the viscosity the viscid flow. Now as this flow progresses downstream, the action of viscosity works its way in, always slowing the flow down or uh, near the boundary layer. But uh, as a result of that, the flow in the core has got to go faster. Why is that? Well, it's because the average velocity at every station along this pipe must be constant. So if I'm slowing the flow down in the, uh, in the uh, viscid core region, I must be squirting the flow out in the, uh, uh, in the inviscid core region. Eventually, this dotted line is supposed to denote the boundary layer height. Eventually, the two boundary layers will work their way together and the flow will take its steady state or fully developed profile. So the vectors here are longer than the average velocity at the inlet because of this effect that they must be extending or being squirted out the center. We could also talk about what this is doing to the pressure. Now, because we can't slow down the average velocity uh, at any station, it means then that viscosity can't slow down the flow on average. It can slow it near the viscous core region, but then 
the center region is going to accelerate as a result. So where does the viscosity, what is it doing? Well, what it's doing is, is it's pulling energy out of the pressure. So the pressure is constantly dropping along the pipe. It drops quite rapidly in the developing region, and then once it's fully developed, it kind of drops linear thereafter. All right, let's talk about the linear velocity profile. Now, this is an overly simplified velocity profile. You saw what a real velocity profile looks like on a flat plate in that video. But in this case, let's just assume that it's kind of a couette flow there, that it's a linear velocity <coughs> uh, over a height h, and then above it, there's going to be some inviscid region where the velocity is constant. So for real velocity vectors, it might be that the scalar components u, v, and y have uh, dependency x, y, z, and t. However, for this linear velocity profile, we're assuming that the velocity is only in the x direction, so the u direction, and it's only a function of y. And I've drawn it here as a vector, so it has a unit vector component and a scalar component. Now, more formally, uh, I would write the velocity vector like this. So below y is equal to h, the velocity is linear. So you can see that uh, it's y over h. If y is 0, the velocity is 0. It adheres to the no slip. And as y goes to h, the ratio becomes 1, and you just get the constant free stream velocity. And we're assuming that the velocities in the uh, y and z direction are 0. Above the height, above the boundary layer height, the velocity is just constant. So if I take that velocity profile and I insert it into our simple, incompressible, viscous uh, drag, uh, viscous shear stress definition, then you can see that uh, upon operating on it, I'll get a constant uh, shear stress in this linear region and then zero shear stress above the linear region, so in the constant region. And that makes a lot of sense. There's no shear stress in the inviscid core, and there's constant shear stress in the viscid core. Now I can use this very simplified profile to solve basic problems. Here's one here. A block is sliding down a surface. Let me draw the free body diagram. Here's the block, and it's sliding down this surface. The surface is inclined at 15 degrees. That's not in the problem statement. That's a mistake on my part. So the block is this inclined surface. It's inclined 15 degrees. There's a thin layer of oil there, SAE 30 oil, one millimeter thick. What's the terminal velocity of the block? Well, the way forward is some basic uh, dynamics. Uh, MA is equal to the sum of the forces. Now, because they're asking for the terminal velocity, that would mean that the acceleration is 0. So it's a really a statics problem. And I'm going to rotate this block so it's easier for me to visualize. Um, I'm going to rotate it kind of into a horizontal position. So in so doing, the weight shifts to the right. And I can see that on the left, acting on the left, would be some weight times sine theta term. Right? That's pulling the block to the left. And on the right is this friction term. It's the friction of the block and the oil, slowing it down. So the force balance would look something like this. And so it's the balance of the weight versus the friction. And when those two come in equilibrium, we'll be at the terminal velocity. So if I assume a, veloc a linear velocity profile, it means I have an expression for this tau. And this is a great just kind of shoot from the hip. What is an estimation of the, uh, the viscous shear stress there? So I can insert this expression into this equation and rearrange them for the velocity, which is here. Right, That's the velocity of the block. And I get this expression down here. And I think I was given everything. I was given the weight or the mass of the block and the angle and so forth. So I can just do a little plug and chug, and I get 0.15 meters per second. So that's, that's the solution I get. And we can use this in all kinds of configurations. Anytime you see some layer of water and a block sliding along, definitely pull out that linear velocity profile assumption and have at it. Whether it's a conical situation, block sliding down, an incline, or whatnot. All right, try out some problems and see how you do. Good luck.